Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. And uh, during these Hagley History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the most innovative research being done out of the Hagley Library collections, especially by researchers who have been supported uh, by research grants and fellowships from the Hagley Center. One such scholar is joining me today, Dr. Lara Friedenfelds, uh, who is a historian of science with a particular interest in women's experience of markets and technology. And uh, we're going to talk about um, a, a research project called a uh, portion of a book project. Uh, and the uh, research uh, proposal was called Buying for the Baby Too Soon, uh, Marketing to Pregnant Women and its Implications for Early Pregnancy Loss, for which she received support in the form of a research grant uh, from the center. And uh, Dr. Freenfels, thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, why don't you introduce us to your book project? Sure, I'm so glad to be here. So right, my book uh, was published last year. It's called The Myth of the Perfect Pregnancy, mm. A History of Miscarriage in America. And I started uh, working on this book. The seed of this book was actually planted when I had a miscarriage. Um, and it was a great surprise to me. I didn't anticipate that this could be something that would happen. I was 30 years old, I was healthy. Um, I was finishing up my PhD in history of science at Harvard. And I was finishing a dissertation that would become my first book, The Modern Period, Menstruation in 20th Century America. So I knew a lot about the history of women's health. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that the experience I had, which was a first trimester pregnancy loss, was something that women um, a couple centuries ago would have thought of as a, you know, unfortunate but kind of run-of-the-mill experience, that this was mm -hmm. part a regular part of women's childbearing at a time when mm. women had many pregnancies and many children, um, and that, that the experience has changed over time. What I didn't know, somehow I had missed, despite all of my knowledge, was just how common these losses are. So mm. about 20% of confirmed pregnancies miscarry, and we give that number, um, it, it's, it's, sounds quite high and it's higher than it would have been even at the beginning of this project back, you know, this is before I had my children back in 2000, uh, before I had a chance to write my first book. Um, and at that point, a doctor would have told you there's about a 12, maybe a 15% of miscarrying a pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason that number has gone up is because we're detecting more and more pregnancies with our use of very accurate home pregnancy tests. Mm -hmm. um, so this experience is tremendously common, but at the same time, our common popular sources about pregnancy tend to encourage us to bond with our pregnancies the first moment we know about them mm. at a stage when they're still very likely to miscarry. So as a historian of women's health, when this happened to me and it took me by surprise, I said, this has to be investigated. I need to look at how we came to, first of all, our current understanding, which is, it's not that everyone feels exactly the same, but the the popular way of understanding and helping women understand pregnancy loss is that whenever it happens, you're going to grieve as if you've lost a child. Um, and I knew that, that women 200 years ago mostly didn't have that experience. Um, and knowing that really helped me cope with my experience. So I wanted to bring that to women, but also ask this question, how did we come to have this different belief about it? How did we come to have, in fact, kind of the wrong idea about this biological process? Mm -hmm. uh, and when I started researching, I knew right away that this would have to be a very broad ranging book, that as a historian of, of science, I might go immediately for the history of medicine, I might go immediately to the medical story, right? How I want to know about prenatal care and embryology. Of course, those are really important. But also as a historian of science um, who's interested in, the, in social history, we know that, that what shapes medicine and our experience of our bodies and our health isn't just somehow from medicine and science, mm -hmm. it's actually mm -hmm. from the broader culture. And in this case, it was immediately clear to me that I was going to need to investigate consumer culture mm -hmm. in addition to the, the science and medicine and technology. And I suppose that's what directed you toward uh, Hagley. 
I knew Hagley would be the place that would be where I would find, um, you know, so I, I had some sense of the, the phenomenon of the consumer culture around pregnancy today that I was trying to investigate. Um, and what I was looking for at the Hagley was both sort of a sense of in the broad scale, what changed about consumer culture, what, you know, in the rise of consumer culture, what brought us to understand childhood and pregnancy and even early mm. pregnancy um, differently. And also I was hoping to find a smoking gun. I wanted to find the market researcher <laughs> saying that they were targeting women during pregnancy. Mm. Uh, and, and that, you know, so we'll talk about that because I actually found both in my oh. research at the Hagley. Yeah. Well, what collections did you use? Um, so I used, I mean, I, I basically opened the catalog and looked at everything I searched under everything under maternity and baby and pregnancy, um, anything to do, I, because I work on women's health issues, you know, any term that has to do with sex has to go in there. Um, mm -hmm. just because that was often where reproductive health was categorized. Um, and I found, I, so I found a, a scattering of interesting sources that all, you know, tell a little bit of the story. Um, I found that to understand the history of consumer culture and, mm -hmm. and how buyers approach consumption, an obvious source was the Sears catalogs and actually the Hagley mm -hmm. owns those. Yeah. And owns the entire series. So mm -hmm. it was really exciting to be able to go through them and to sit down and look at every page in, in detail, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because that's how you, it's that sometimes it's that fine grained detail work, right. That shows you the patterns. Um, and then uh, I found also a couple of really interesting pamphlets that were, um, that were pamphlets for teaching people about their health and about child rearing that were actually produced by manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So that's of course fascinating to see what advice and when, uh, when did that start? What does it look like? And how do you wanna think about it in relation to the kinds of um, sales platforms that are now giving us health advice about children and, mm -hmm. and pregnancy? Um, and then the, the archival source that you truly can't find anywhere else, of course, was the Ernest Dichter archives and mm -hmm. his marketing research reports, um, which actually contain both, you know, it's interesting to see what he was advising companies to do about pregnant women. Um, and also fascinating because there's just enough of some of that ethnographic research mm -hmm. uh, included in some of the reports to be able to pull that out too. So let's, I suppose, uh, if you could paint with the broad strokes first, what did you learn about um, the sort of change at the level of consumer culture? Um, so what I was able to do was to actually pinpoint when the big uh, marketers and advertisers were starting to move toward um, advertising to pregnant women as a category of people, mm -hmm. right? So the Sears catalog had in the early catalogs in the 1897 catalog, I can show you some slides in a moment, but the, the baby related stuff is just scattered throughout. So part of my question was, when did marketers like Sears figure out to target pregnant women in a life stage? These days we would call it life stage marketing. So mm. don't assume that, that women should run around to every different store to find their baby goods. You would put them all in one place. If you were, for example, running the Right Start catalog, you would have all your stuff right there. If, if you know, prospective mother wants to find out what all she needs to buy, she can find it all there together. So I was able to use the Sears catalogs to trace out a little bit when that happened and how it happened. Mm. Um, and then with the, with the Dictor um, archive, I was able to find him actually noting when, you know, when he realized you need to target pregnant women and preferably before they have their first child. Mm. Um, reading that, you know, as, <laughs> so if you've been a parent yourself, you say, oh, I see. Yes, I felt targeted, but now I see. <laughs> and it wasn't last year that marketers figured out that they should do that. So those, you know, those were the big insights. And, and what time period are, are we talking about here for these uh, okay, events, yeah. for these processes? So that, that's the 1960s that the, mm. the Dictor 
um, archives start showing reports that show this targeting of pregnant women. And I think that's probably about right um, in terms of when there was self-conscious understanding that, mm. that it was a, a valuable market and one that was urgent to get into early. Um, and that's part of, of course, the broader story in my book is why do marketers aggressively target women the moment they get a positive home pregnancy test, you know, when a pregnancy is still very insecure? Mm -hmm. uh, and what are the what's motivating them and what is their understanding that leads them to to be that pushy? Mm -hmm. and, and what did you find out? What what why does this make business sense? Well, it makes business sense, it turns out, because uh, women tend to be very brand loyal uh, to mm -hmm. these kinds of products. And this was, so this was not shocking to me at all because I had done research on the history of menstruation and mm -hmm. I worked in the Kotex archives and they found that, yeah, yeah, fascinating archive. The company actually at the time maintained an archive and was able oh, to like, go to the history factory to go spend a week uh, digging through it, which was fantastic. Uh, but what I found was that they realized pretty early that that girls tended to, first of all, girls tended to use whatever product their mother gave them. But mm. if you could get in there before the mother and hand them a product, chances are they would stick with the first one. Mm. Um, and that was sort of seemed to be true in my interviews. You know, my interviews seemed to confirm that until the younger generations were more interested, actually, in the pattern that we see uh, in Dictor's reports in what was advertised to them on TV. And they started to be mm -hmm. a little more like skeptical of mom. Maybe mom doesn't know the new ways. Maybe mom is actually your least good source for this. Maybe the commercial will give you a better idea what modern people do. Um, so Dictor figured this out. Actually, the, the most enlightening report that I looked at was his report for the Playtex nurser. Um, which was in 1962. So the Playtex mm -hmm. Nurser in 1962 was this fancy new bottle. It was made of plastic and it had plastic liners. And we know in 1962, plastic was, you know, the modern way to be a mom was to use plastic. <laughs> and so it had these plastic disposable liners that were supposed to keep the bottle sanitary, right? So think about it in a time when you didn't have dishwashers, to sterilize mm. baby bottles, you had to boil them. Mm. And that is a real pain. And if you're taking care of an infant, the last thing you need is that chore. <laughs> so you could see why it was appealing. Um, it turns out it didn't work as well as advertised. That's one of the things that Dick <laughs> found. Um, and that women were frustrated when they accidentally mm. got their fingers all over the, the what was supposed to be the part that didn't get dirty. And then they were worried they were getting, because germs were an enormous concern in this time period too, mm. as Americans were starting to really understand the implication of germs and, and how they cause sickness in a, in a, sort of broad popular way. I mean, similarly to today, people wanted things that were antibacterial and there was a sense, and of course your infant, your newborn, you wanna especially protect. So people were excited about this new bottle um, and, and they, so Playtex was already marketing it at the point that Dictor joined on mm -hmm. um, and they said to him, you know, what should we do? How can we market it better? Um, they had already produced this commercial a TV commercial that was nationwide. And amazingly, what Dichter found was that more than 60% of his respondents had seen it and could talk about it. Mm. And that is something, right? I mean, that is where Dichter, you can see in the report that he's kind of saying, whoa, yep, at least for some kinds of products, advertisements are really powerful. And I think it's this, you know, this phenomenon that I saw in my menstruation research, which was, women saying, mm, yeah, maybe, maybe I can learn from the TV better than from mm. my mom, that maybe the new products that promise to be better and new um, in this very forward looking modern appeal, you know, American culture, especially in the 60s, we're excited to be modern and forward looking and find the newest thing and that it would be better, make our lives better. Um, and this happens with baby things just the same way that it happens, you know, with lots of other things. And Dictor really latched onto this. I'll read you a little quote from, because it's, it's so good, um, from this report. So um, he said to, to, to his audience uh, at Playtex, the very special psychological climate which envelops a household expecting or raising a baby 
together with the profound psychological changes and developments which occur among both men and women who are expecting or rearing a baby, create an almost unobstructed access for baby product advertising. Within this sensitive and differentiated atmosphere, the Playtex Nurser ad has created intense impact and product interest. So Dichter, you know, Playtex probably guessed this. I'm sure their sales did well if that's what Dichter found, but he was able to actually do these focus groups um, to discuss this with women and find that in fact, they could all talk about it or 60 plus percent could, which I think is, I mean, you know, it, it was very striking to me. I was surprised that the commercials had had quite that impact until I thought through it. And, you know, honestly thought about my own, what, you know, what did I do? I was the first, my husband and I were the eldest in our families, first to have kids. We were far from home, um, as, as has been the case for a large portion of Americans for more than 100 years now, mm -hmm. raising our, our children far from our natal families. Um, and it happened that we didn't have any close friends who had had children. So we, we relied on these sources, you know, and we thought we were savvy. So we went to, to uh, Consumer Reports, perhaps, to tell us. But we were relying much more on this, these public sources rather mm -hmm. than what Dichter had anticipated initially, I think, which was that for this kind of thing, it's so intimate. Um, it comes with so many traditions, right? Family comes with so many traditions. You would think people would want to go to their mothers and their sisters first. But it turns out, even maybe if they did go there first, these commercials had tremendous impact. So part of the interesting story here is that realizing that commercials reach women during pregnancy and he could see pregnancy was a special time to reach them. Of mm. course, when you're talking about a baby bottle, right? This is the first time you're gonna have purchased a baby bottle. Um, and probably whatever you start with is whatever you will continue with. I would say, you know, an economist would say there's a, there's a little bit of a, a barrier to, to trying a new product. There's, there's a, that initial investment, right? And in trying something new. Um, new parents are exhausted, and the last thing that they want to do is try something new if whatever they're doing is okay enough, they can limp along and use it. Um, so, so there are clearly reasons to get in there. Um, and market researchers, um, in addition to Dictor, realize that actually people are purchasing a lot of things. So some of them are like baby bottles and baby clothes, cribs. Um, you know, they're very specifically baby related. Mm -hmm. um, diapers is an ongoing purchase, right? It's quite expensive, actually. Uh, but then there's also things that people start buying um, that, that are not specific to the baby, but might be enormous upgrades. I actually did one of the little finds in, in the Hagley was a, a 1940s brochure about new home, but, you know, a, a, like marketing new homes, mm -hmm. which was like, now that we're having a baby, we need to upgrade to a home mm -hmm. instead of an apartment. So, you know, by even by the mid forties, there were some marketers starting to imagine um, family building as a time for the biggest purchases you would make in your life. Mm. Um, more recently, actually, they've been the the expectation is that they can that these um, advertisements to pregnant women are monetized at five times the value of general advertisements. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this audience is very valuable, and yeah. and the intuition that you could make a lot of money by reaching this audience was not wrong. And mm -hmm. people upgrade their cars, they want a minivan or they want a Volvo because they feel it's safe or, you know, so people, they upgrade their insurance. There are many, many advertisers who find pregnant women and their spouses to be a really valuable target. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of market pressure there. Um, and, and that's an insight that, you know, that Dichter was clearly sort of having. <laughs> um, Very clearly. And, you know, yeah, and I could be, I mean, I could be reading extra into this, but to me, he was at least trying to convey to his client a sense of surprise um, and how impressed he was at the success mm. of this ad. Um, so another really fascinating thing about that report, and that just, you know, you're looking for a smoking gun, but you just don't know when yeah. it's that smoking. You, it's very <laughs> exciting. I know things historians get excited about, right? But <laughs> but in this report, you know, he said he said, well, we realized that we should ask different groups of women. So we're not going to just do mothers, 
or just pregnant women. So he had divided it into uh, women who already had at least one child and, and might be also pregnant um, and women who were pregnant for the first time. Mm -hmm. So that he could differentiate what happens when you introduce this product to these two groups. And he asked everybody, you know, had you seen the ad? It was the pros, what he called the prospective mothers, the women who had not yet had a child who were most excited about the ad. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. that accords with my <laughs> experience. Once I had kids, I started to know people who had kids and I started to have better word of mouth. Um, mm -hmm. sources of information. It's amazing how consistent this was for 50 years and, and, and counting. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that these women, so, so these focus groups are so cool. I wish we had videos of them. I mean, I wish we had transcripts. I, I learned recently that Dichter destroyed all the, the background for oh. many of his studies pre-1970 in around 1970. He, I mean, he didn't, I don't know if he, he just got rid of them. So we don't have all these notes that would be so much fun to see, uh, but we have some hints. So he did these focus groups where he actually carried these bottles, he or, or his research associates. And I have to say, I do wonder um, if these were women research associates who did the research. He always describes it either as we or makes it sound like as if he did all of it himself, but we, we know he didn't. He had a large staff. Um, so they brought the bottles into these focus groups and gave them the package and said, try it, see what you think. And these were women who were pregnant. So he, they didn't ask them to actually use it with a baby, mm -hmm. um, but they said, try putting it together, see what you think. Mm -hmm. um, and the responses that he quoted are just, you know, are just fabulous because, <laughs> because what he found was that experienced women, you know, women who had had babies, you know, partly you get used to whatever it is you normally use and then anything else seems hard, but they kind of said, yeah, I mean, how's a babysitter gonna use it? Cause it was fussy. You had to get the plastic lining in and lined up and you had to get this thing over the top of the bottle and people were frustrated. They got their fingers in the wrong part. It was finicky. Um, so the people who already had done this were kind of like, yeah, well, I mean, maybe it's more sanitary. I don't know. They were not sure that a bottle was going to solve colic, <laughs> which they're right. <laughs> yeah. Probably made it a lot worse. Well, or, you know, the place, so the Playtex nurser promised that the baby wouldn't swallow air. Um, that so, because they do kind of swallow air more with bottles. Um, but we now, I mean, we now know, we're now quite confident that that's not the source of colic. <laughs> but at the time, you know, I could see, I do understand you try everything. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a colicky baby, anybody who yes. can promise you any kind of snake oil is likely to be able to sell it to you if you think it might <laughs> solve what is a very uh, distressing problem for the whole family. Um, but this, this was a promise and people who were pregnant were more likely to take it seriously than the people who had already dealt with a colicky baby who really didn't think that some plastic liner was gonna change uh, the whole thing, um, even if it did help the baby swallow less gas. So it was, so the women who had already tried something else were not all that, looking all that persuadable to change what they were doing. On the other hand, the first time uh, pregnant women uh, just had the most fun responses. Let's see if I, I have my, so I have my book here, uh, there it is. It's of the perfect pregnancy. Yeah, and um, I have the quotes in here. I was just looking at the, the first quote. I'm not good at finding quotes fast, but basically the women said, you know, the, who, a couple of the quotes said, this is kind of fun to put together. It's so interesting, it's complicated. One said, my husband will love this. It's like a complicated <laughs> thing for him to figure out and put together. Um, and, you know, I have to say, after you've had a baby, the last thing you want in the middle of the night, as some of the perspective, as some of the experienced mothers said, was a bottle that's complicated to put together. Um, right. But if you haven't done it yet, you can be seduced by mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. fancy gadgets of modernity. Mm -hmm. And Dichter figured this out, and, but he was on the side of the fancy gadgets. <laughs> now, you know, I have not ever used the Playtex nurser myself, so I might be um, attributing more to the marketing, maybe, maybe it works well, maybe it's, it's still being produced, except now they say, you know, trusted by generations of mothers. <laughs> <in their ad. laughs> 
Um, but I do wonder if his insight that you could reach people at that moment, not just that it's a sensitive moment, um, but that when they don't have experience and they are Americans who are saturated with this culture of forward, looking forward, of thinking that the next modern thing will make their lives better. Mm. And that was a, you know, a vision that Dichter uh, sort of sold through, throughout his career, um, that, that were highly vulnerable to those sales pitches then. Uh -huh. um, I definitely have a few gadgets around myself. Like I said, I keep comparing to my own experience, which I think we all do when we study something like parenting, mm -hmm. um, that, that I was sold because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and I, my parents couldn't, couldn't assess one way or another whether they'd be any good because they didn't have them when they were having kids. And, uh, you know, it really is this vulnerable moment to trying new things. Mm. Uh, so for marketers, just the power of that, of people being willing to say, yes, this is a fussy gadget, but I'm excited by that. Mm -hmm. And this is something I never tried before, but wow, I'm expecting and I'm trying lots of things I've never tried before. So I'm kind of naive and, and ready to engage with mm. this whole new life experience. Um, and and that, that's what Dichter discovered and really elucidated for Playtex as they were mm -hmm. figuring out what to do with their bottle. And then, you know, frankly, had in his arsenal. Uh, Dichter was someone who, who took insights, and you can see this if you read all his proposals. So I, I pulled out, when I was doing the research, I pulled everything that had to do with anything with babies or women or sex. So that's my, my usual kind of like categories to look through to find some clues. Um, and, and what I found was that it, he gets an insight from one report and then he applies it to another. So he, mm -hmm. he was a very synthetic, um, very smart guy would, you know, think about, well, what did I learn from the baby food study that I did before that I could apply to Playtex nurses with similar difference. Um, mm -hmm. So I am very confident that once he discovered this for Playtex, that it continued um, to inform how he thought about advising companies from there on in. What would be the implication for the individual prospective mother who has perhaps bought into uh, these promises um, made by advertisers and marketers um, and then experiences pregnancy loss? Yeah, well, I mean, so what happens now so what's interesting is that at the time Dichter was doing this, what I'm talking about is sort of a ground, laying a groundwork for mm. what has become the pattern now. Uh, so as, as recently as the 1990s, um, uh, a journalist who looked into some of this found that market researchers that, that, and, and the, the baby magazine folks who are a big source of this research um, and, and the sales pitches, right? Um, that, that they believed that you could start reaching women in the second trimester. And literally, you know, there's an interview where one of the American baby magazine uh, editors says, well, you know, in the first trimester, the baby's just not real yet. It doesn't seem real to people yet. Um, and they feel sick and they're just not in the mood. It's the second trimester that you barrage them with impressions um, that from the second trimester through six months of after the baby is born. And now, you know, I think that there was an understanding quite a bit. I found a market uh, research report from the 1970s that clearly understood that you had to reach people um, before pregnancy for a whole bunch of, this was for baby toys. I mean, I'm sorry, before the birth that you did have, but, but they were assuming you were reaching women starting in month seven. So that's what they were thinking third trimester, you would start buying stuff. So what has changed and sort of the ante that's been upped is that we've been more willing to think in terms of being bonded with an expected baby before the second trimester. And that's something that has happened after the early 1990s. Um, and where I see it, you know, so, so I saw um, evidence of some of this starting around 2000 of the idea that you should bond with your pregnancy. Um, the idea of bonding was an idea that had moved really from the moment of birth 
uh, which is where that term was coined for in the 1970s. Yeah, the, the people, the experts who were looking at how attachment worked coined, a couple of them coined this idea of, of bonding as this special moment of birth where mm. mother and baby form the basis of their relationship. And that that moment was supposed to be very meaningful. That concept has stressed out a lot of parents since and has been modified in terms of it being any kind of scientific understanding of the phenomenon, um, but popularized easily and quickly. Um, mm. Talking about bonding during your pregnancy is something that actually happens from what I can see kind of spontaneously in the popular, you know, people just started saying it. I mean, it's like <laughs> I did way back searches and I found it starting around 2000. And it's not like some psychologist got out there and said it. Um, it was kind of like people on the internet started saying it. Um, mm -hmm. I do think it comes out of actually to some degree out of the attachment parenting movement, which began in the 1980s, but has ramped up since. Uh, William Sears, who is the founder of it, actually pushes this idea um, that you should start being attached to your pregnancy the, kind of from the moment of conception whenever or whenever you realize, obviously you don't know at conception. That's part of what's funny about the theory a little bit, but, it, <laughs> but that you should start right away. Um, mm. And people start to kind of believe that. But I actually think it's this combination. Like I said, you know, consumer culture is big in there. And part of what happens that people are willing to start thinking in these terms is not just that they've decided there's different things that make the baby real to them, that there's different, that they don't, it's okay if you're, all you have is morning sickness. If what you have is a positive home pregnancy test, we've come to feel like that's enough. But I think mm. part of what has happened is that uh, you get a positive home pregnancy test and immediately you can go to the internet. And if you go to baby center, I can tell you, I've been on baby center a ton doing research and <laughs> Most of the time I open it, there's immediately a pop-up and I could, I could show you that if you'd like, but the pop-up wants you to tell the due date. And if you don't know, it offers you a due date calculator. We could figure it out for you right here, you know? <laughs> um, so it wants to get you in the system immediately. If you get in that system, there are a lot of rewards. You know, it's like maybe people wouldn't have gone to the store to start purchasing, they might not have gone, you know, you might not go to the department store to browse, but hey, if you can stick your due date in at Baby Center and it's gonna show you like fun articles, like, you know, first it'll show you baby names so you can brainstorm and dream. And that's kind of wonderful. I understand, you know, the appeal. If, if pregnancy worked differently than it does, I would, I would not <laughs> object to most of this. It's because it doesn't, it's because the losses are so common that, that I am concerned. Um, and then it shows you fun things to buy. And buying is fun. I mean, Americans love buying stuff and buying stuff for babies is like double fun. I mean, who doesn't <laughs> like to browse for cute little baby outfits? Um, so, I mean, I think that, that Baby Center and others have figured out how to use our consumer culture and our, the way that we experience it as a really highly pleasurable part of our experience of parenting. And, and preparation for parenting um, and mm. to get in there right away with their sales pitches. And I just think there's this unfortunate, you know, I think some of them would say, yeah, it is too bad. But the problem is if I'm Huggies and I try to be ethical and don't pitch you anything about my diapers until you're safely out of the first trimesters, then you're going to end up with Pampers because Pampers is going to get there first. Mm. Um, and I think that's true. So how to have a more ethical business approach, I think would have to be, you know, a larger scale agreement or a, or a widespread decision to shame that big outlets like Baby Center for uh, sending you those ads right away. Uh, but, and partly I think that they hadn't totally recognized the magnitude of the problem um, immediately because mm -hmm. It's, it's not obvious. I mean, I think if you don't already know how common pregnancy loss is until you've accumulated a few years of really distressed letters from women telling you that you've made their life horrible the way you've mm -hmm. handled um, their pregnancy and their pregnancy loss, you might not even realize that you're creating an issue. I would hope by now they do. 
Um, though, so, so I've written actually since the book, I've continued to follow uh, pregnancy apps, which are a new, so, I mean, another thing here, right, when I talked about the Procter and, Procter and Gamble putting out baby books, baby advice books, Lydia Pinkham, I, I could show you those too if we want to look at them, um, is, is that, that that product, they, they're sharing the information and selling you a product at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. that this, this impulse is, you know, challenging us now, and they're giving you health advice with a product, right? They're, they're, they're using the health advice to sell you a product. Um, unfortunately, pregnancy apps and now pregnancy websites as they've developed into more like health advice are actually using being your health advisor to sell you stuff. And I think there's a real mm -hmm. problem um, with a conflict of interest there. Um, mm -hmm. And what they found the apps have figured out now and the websites that it's terrible if you, a woman miscarries and you just don't have any way for her to get out of the system. That is horrible. You know, you keep sending her baby ads and she's had a miscarriage. Um, so they've solved that. But now what happens is they, they sort of divert you into a whole nother set of content. So they bring you more content and the content is about grieving and loss and coming back yeah. and trying again. Um, and I guess I don't think that advertising supported content is the best place uh, to, to be giving us that information, partly because the incentives are, right, to keep you with them, keep you close, keep your, your journey, your fertility journey with us. We'd like to know that you're trying again. We'd like to send you articles. And by the way, we'd like to know the moment you're pregnant again. Um, and I think that it's not obvious unless you dig in and do some of this research that there's actually money to be made on people's grief. I mean, and I mean, and on aggravating the highs and the lows. So it's pretty obvious that they're excited to sell you stuff and, and enhance the highs. And that part, like I said, if there weren't pregnancy loss, I could be okay with that, you know, mm -hmm. but it enhances the lows too. And unfortunately, you know, by lifting you high and then having you have a loss um, and they don't, I don't think they lose anything. I don't think mm -hmm. they're being punished by the market um, for that, for doing that to you. And instead, now they've got the opportunity to keep you close with material about grieving and trying again. Um, and I wish we could break that cycle. I think mm -hmm. it's highly problematic, but I, I don't yet see the obvious way to do it, except by encouraging people to separate their sources of uh, health advice from their mm -hmm. sources of product advice. I, you know, and again, I'm not, you know, I loved the consumer reports and the baby bargains book. And, you know, we all shop at some point, either during pregnancy or right afterwards, if we're very women who have had a late loss often we, um, but it's, and, and that can be a nice thing. It's a big part of American culture. We're not going to toss out consumer culture, I don't think, but we really need to, to reshape it and contain it a little bit for this mm -hmm. kind of circumstance. Yeah, uh, because, you know, these are very powerful entities targeting a very vulnerable group of people. And on the one hand, you might say, well, we're offering services. But on the other hand, you're also pretty ruthlessly exploiting people in a vulnerable position. Yeah, I mean, so what's interesting is that I also think I'm not sure how aware they are of what they're doing. And sometimes mm -hmm. they are and sometimes they aren't. Uh, and it's it's been interesting to me to watch uh, entrepreneurs say, oh, support women entrepreneurs, support mom entrepreneurs. Um, <laughs> and then it ends up being mothers selling each other anxiety. Um, and, and maybe it's genuine, you know, someone says, I was really, in fact, very concerned that my baby would, would die of SIDS. Um, so I developed this ankle anklet that, keeps track of their heart rate the whole time. And if there's ever any, you know, any dip, you get an alert at your bedside and you can run to the baby. This is a real product. And, and at least one thing I saw about it was that it was kind of like one concerned parent to another, you know, right. 
I have a product to help ease your anxiety, but <laughs> products that are to ease anxiety often produce the anxiety they ease and, mm-hmm. and know mm-hmm. that. Um, so I think it's, it's some of it probably is uh, cynical, but some of it really is, you know, everyone winding each other up and participating mm-hmm. in a market around pregnancy and babies. And it is a vulnerable audience, but not vulnerable, you know, I mean, look, the people we're largely talking about today here are middle class, um, can afford to buy stuff, can afford Mm -hmm. to shop a lot, Mm -hmm. uh, probably highly educated. So not vulnerable in the sense of, you know, there are many vulnerable people in our culture, in our society, um, and, and who need various, like who deserve much more protection and respect than they get. And this is it's like, I hate to call them too vulnerable, but just, we don't, I, I think we're not so aware of the reality of the circumstance and, and who's pitching to us and how, um, mm-hmm. and it just looks very appealing. So until you put it all together and kind of, you know, as I have uh, looked at who's selling you what, I mean, I think it's very enlightening. Like I would encourage anyone to go, to go look at the material produced for the marketers. Mm-hmm. So, any of these websites, they'll they'll have the the retail facing. They'll tell you as a pregnant woman, you know how you might engage with this website. Go go look at what they have for marketers, and then see how you feel about it. <laughs> like for advertisers, do you still mm-hmm. feel good about it after you see what they've promised advertisers? Mm-hmm. Uh, they've promised them, you know, your data and your attention. Uh, maybe have promised them that that there's going to be bloggers who do. Fe- product features at the women who like those, those bloggers that are attached to the website, you Mm -hmm. might end up feeling a little more skeptical of the whole package. Mm -hmm. I think that's great advice for, uh, for the consumer, uh, as well as uh, the researcher. Um, Because my next question would be what advice you might have for people doing social research of perhaps even family related research in a business archive? Oh, I mean, so I think, I think that people like me tend to find the joy is in the fact that, that you have to hunt a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, so it's always a matter of finding all those keywords and throwing them in Mm -hmm. and following Mm -hmm. the leads and seeing what you, what you happen to come up with. Um, And we get very excited about small crumbs. I mean, so, and I think that's good. I think that's so. To, you know, it's a, it's so. It's an interesting thing. I I see people. This is a bigger philosophical question in history. People talk about oh, digital archives. We could save everything. We should save everything. And historians get very excited. We need to save all the things. Um, but to me, you know, when I think about part of what charms me it, as a researcher is mm-hmm. actually the search for things that were not intended to be saved. Um, people, people who do research on reproductive and, and sexual topics tend to find, you know, our, a lot of our materials are ephemera. Um, mm-hmm. They were not mm-hmm. intended to be uh, for an audience that was going to archive them. And that's why they're so great is when you happen to find them, when they just got stashed in someone's attic and never thrown away. That's when they're really the coolest. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, so I think it's a matter of just knowing that that's what you do um, and taking that identity as you're the kind of historian in at least in this kind of an archive who's going to treat it as hey you know broad scope throw in all the search terms follow any that if some if a search term leads you to something interesting then look at what else is in that search term um, and just kind of like follow the leads and enjoy mm-hmm. whatever small things you can find because it's it is more about that hunting process um, and this is true, you know, lots of women's intimate history has this problem or, ha- I mean, I don't, like I said, not necessarily a problem. It's a, it's a challenge. It's a special kind of history. So looking through letters, if you want to find evidence of pregnancy and miscarriage, it's rarely um, indexed in women's mm. letters. So even if you have collections of women's letters, um, and it's rarely indexed when it's mentioned in men's letters. So the women who have done, mostly women researchers who have done this research have done it by just literally reading 
many, many, many letters and having kind colleagues who, you know, send forward them when they happen to see them, <laughs> make it be known that this is what you're doing. Um, so it just, it, the research is like reading, reading an archive for what's not intended to be particularly highlighted there. Um, and I think you just have to enjoy that. Um, mm -hmm. But also I have to say, it's great that you give grants for people to come spend some time because mm -hmm. it takes time. This is research. I mean, some research takes time because you have voluminous archives. So if you have boxes and boxes and boxes of, uh, you know, from a company and somebody wants to do a history involving that company, clearly they need months to do it. Um, but I really appreciated that Hagley was willing to give me a whole week uh, full time to spend in the archive. And I did, I tell you, I kept, I kept the archivist there till they said, no, we have to close the doors <laughs> um, because we have to hunt. We need the time to read, to just read all of what Dichter said about a lot of things, that a lot of reports that had nothing um, particularly that went into the book. So, you know, what you see in the book is a few crumbs but I needed to do to look through many more of his reports to understand where they were coming from. And also, like I said, to ha happen to find that right one. So I didn't know that somehow the Playtex bottle was going to illuminate the history mm -hmm. of this carriage. <laughs> um, but I, I had some idea, well, OK, if I'm going to go to the reports most likely to do it, then baby stuff. How about that? And that's mm -hmm. what do you go through them and read all the stuff and those it's those little hints here and there that that are really exciting and give you those if you're lucky like I said I got really lucky and found some smoking guns there mm -hmm. I think that's really valuable insight thank you so much for sharing and thank you so much for speaking with me today thank you uh, and for the audience if you'd like more Hagley history hangouts or more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, and our research grants and fellowship programs, visit us online at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y.org, and uh, don't be a stranger.